So let me begin by saying good morning to you all. My name is Carlos Medina, pronouns he, him, his. And I have the pleasure and the privilege of serving as Learning Services Manager at Catalyst of San Diego and Imperial Counties. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all today to Catalyst Summer Corporate Philanthropy Connector, sponsored by Nordson Corporation Foundation. Now I'll be facilitating today's uh, discussion, but before I jump into our speakers and we get right into it, I wanted to just briefly chat about why this session is so important to the team at Catalyst and why I believe it's important to you too. So you're here because you share our commitment to learning best practices, or as I like to frame it, better practices, implying uh, constantly growing and improving, but better practices towards corporate social responsibility, because you understand also that prioritizing diversity and inclusion is important, and also because you understand it'll take collaboration between both teams, CSR and DEI, to ensure an impactful social change ecosystem. So today you'll have an opportunity to learn from our speakers as well as from each other. And now for some quick housekeeping to kick us off. I just wanna give everyone a heads up. We'll start off uh, for today. We'll hear from our speakers and then we'll break into small group discussions for about 10 minutes. We'll have a chance to connect with peers and discuss strategies that you can explore to further connect uh, your DEI and CSR teams. And then just uh, three quick reminders, the webinar is being recorded. And at the end of the webinar, we will send you a link with the recording that you're able to watch later. And also there'll be a valuation poll at the end of this webinar. We would very much appreciate just a minute of your time to complete that poll because that information will be used to help us to improve future programming. And I believe that's it. So with all of the logistics out of the way, I'd like to introduce Sara Vaz, Community Relations Manager for Nordson Corporation Foundation and also Catalyst Board Member to kick off the fun stuff. Thanks, Carlos. We're really happy that we're able to sponsor this series, I think for the second or third year in a row, because I just believe it's so important that we come together in community and learn from each other. And this se session actually came out of our last session where we talked about we, how we really needed to connect our external DEI efforts with our internal communications and focus. So we have two expert speakers on that today that we're so excited to learn from and learn with each other. So I'm happy to introduce Tiana Ostel, who is a corporate citizenship specialist with Illumina, where she leads their global giving and volunteering efforts. In her role, Tiana works cross-functionally with DNI, HR, and employees to drive social impact. She believes diversity and inclusion are integral to any social impact program and is passionate about increasing equity in all of its dimensions. Amen. In 2019, Tiana was recognized with the Benevity Buffy Award for Leadership, Innovation, and Impact in Administrating Goodness Programs. So that's awesome. Congratulations. And we have Annie Worth Lieberman, who's with Northrop Grumman as a corporate citizenship representative for all of Southern California. In her role, Annie oversees the company's CSR efforts in the greater Los Angeles and San Diego areas. This includes managing charitable giving, community engagement strategies, and K-12 talent pipeline development. Annie is committed to public service, having received the Secretary of Defense Award for Outstanding Public Service and the Secretary of Defense Award for exceptional public service. Wow, so we have two, you know, all-stars here today. Yay! Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Carlos to get the program started and just want to thank Annie and Tiana for, for being here with us today and sharing their knowledge with us. Thanks, Libby. Thank you, Sarah, and I want to second that note of gratitude. We got um, suspense is building, got a little bit of background about our speakers that I'd love to start now. And Tiana, if I can kick it off to you, just a little bit of background about this last year and your role in CSR and just what are reflections and perspectives that are rising for you? Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. It's it's always strange to hear your bio said to you as we're on the screen. Uh, but hi everyone, uh, my name is Tiana Ostel. I work for Illumina, uh, which is a DNA sequencing company based here in San Diego. Um, we produce about 80% of the world's sequencing information in the world. So last year has been a very interesting year for us um, in that fun fact, we actually sequenced the first COVID strain. 
Uh, so it's been really interesting to see, I think, the work that we do also through a diverse and inclusion lens, uh, which actually leads me into some of the work that I've done over this past year. Um, or I should really say over the past four years, my four year anniversary is actually in two weeks. Uh, but essentially when I first joined the company, I remember that we did not talk about diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, people very much felt like it was not appropriate to talk about. Um, and it is something that is for people's personal lives instead of professional lives. Um, I remember when I first joined and I was curious about the diversity and inclusion initiatives we had, um, one of my very well-meaning colleagues said, oh, well, like Illumina is diverse enough. Like, do you just see the amount of women working in the workplace? Uh, and so it was interesting having a conversation about what is intersectionality um, and how are we seeing people not only with their, their physical differences, but also with different ability levels, um, different sexual orientations, and all of the different nuances that make us diverse. Uh, I've also been able to see the formulation of our employees employee resource groups. Uh, we have eight in total right now, um, focusing on a variety of different issues. And in my role on the CSR um, side of the house, I'm able to specialize in d &I when it comes to our grant making. So ensuring that our grants are equitable uh, for all of our different uh, communities that we live and work, and ensuring that when we have any grant that's going out the door, we have a special attention that's being paid to the communities that are most impacted by the issues that we support, mainly oncology, rare and undiagnosed genetic diseases, and genomic literacy. So personally, I don't actually sit on the DNI side of the house. Instead, I sit on our CSR team and we work very closely with our very young and emerging DNI team that was created about a year and a half ago uh, to partner. So working in uh, parallel lives and uh, I'm actually also very interested in hearing from, from Annie and that our program is very new. We are building the plane as it's flying uh, and very much in a, a younger state, which is very exciting. It means there's a lot of room for growth. And I think uh, there's been a really incredible amount of employees have been able to support this and inform our progress. Uh, and uh, excited to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Tiana. I'm excited to learn from you. And especially when you talked about the employee resource groups, which we'll get into a little bit later. But I'd love to also just um, hear from Annie in reflections over this last 18 months or so. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And um, I will just say, leading off, I just got a message from my, say my internet was unstable and I tried to hardline and so I apologize if I'm freezing up slightly or if there are some glitches. Um, well, again, thank you for having me today. Um, so I will say over the past year, um, gosh, so much has changed. Uh, when I joined Northrop Grumman, we already had a very long established um, diversity and inclusion program. I sit in the corporate citizenship group, but we're all under the, the umbrella of global corporate responsibility. But in the last year, um, in the wake of the, the civil unrest across the country, it really um, sort of created a wave of change that came up and sort of reforming a lot of the things that we were already doing um, for many, many years. So we have 13 employee resource groups. Diversity and inclusion is, is part of so much of our messaging and our internal conversations, but it came to light as we sort of had these town calls and these um, group sessions and started hearing from our leaders that there were some things we needed to change um, and some things we needed to collaborate a little closer on. Um, for instance, um, Tiana mentioned grant making. Um, we had focus areas for grant making, but adding on a layer, um, we might focus on military and veterans and STEM, but we added on a layer of um, making sure that we are bringing in the concepts of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, to our grant making in all of our communities and on the global level. Um, I will also say that um, we changed our, the name of our, our diversity and inclusion group to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So now we're D-E-E-N-I, -E -E and I am very much in the group that is um, campaigning for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. <laughs> because, um, you know, as we all know, um, belonging means you are already at the table and you're part of the family, as opposed to us reaching out and to our goal. Um, so well, I think Northrop Grumman has been focused and committed to this work for a very, very long time, but there's always room for change, and which is also why I'm really enjoying hearing um, Tiana's experiences as they build their program. So, 
to see what, you know, how can this be done differently? What can we do differently? Um, yeah. Wonderful, Annie. I think we're all here for that same reason is how can we learn from each other? And one thing I would be curious is you mentioned a little bit about the beginning um, start of your journey, uh, Tiana, especially when it was younger and how things have changed in your time. But I'd be curious, where can other companies begin in terms of connecting their CSR and DEI teams? Yeah, and I think a lot of that had to do with doing a really honest audit of ourselves and working with our own teams and making sure that we had, I think Annie hit this, but that belonging. Like, did we have the diverse voices on the table? And um, actually a resource that I wanted to share with all of you uh, is from an organization called Time's Up. Um, and this organization um, actually released a guide that is a guide for uh, corporations to champion diversity and inclusion. And that's a guide that I've relied on heavily over the past few years and has some um, really interesting elements, including working from home. So I think at the very beginning of our journey, and I'm saying beginning as in two years ago, um, we did a really honest audit about what is the makeup of our team, where are the gaps, and then also where can we kind of empower employees that have been our constant supporters over the past few years. Uh, I do think when, um, although in, in this, I, I'm using DNI because that's what we use, but I definitely believe in the DIEB and many other, other letters. Um, I think when, when we're in this space, um, sometimes corporations can too heavily rely on uh, people of color, especially female people of colors when it comes to informing this decision without any sort of financial compensation. And so that's one thing that we're always very aware of is that when we are relying on these voices, this change really needs to come from the top. Um, it needs to come from your leadership and ensuring that they have the authority to actually make these changes, but all of those decisions and the conversations that are being had are informed by employees of color and employees who may not be represented in those leadership rooms. So that's been a very interesting dance that we've had to have um, in that we are asking for employees to lend their time, lend their experience, but also making sure that, that um, those acts are being recognized in both financial and also uh, professional development ways. And so um, that's been a really incredible experience to be able to identify these high potential employees in partnership with our DNI group and ensure that their voices are, are being elevated. And, and many of the people who have um, um, who are those employees or leaders of our ERGs and are actually being fast-tracked for promotions um, and ensuring that they have a very positive trajectory because they are such essential um, essential powerhouses when it comes to building out our programs. But I think if you are starting out in the beginning, one thing that I found very helpful was just to see like, where do you have gaps? And this is gaps that need to be intersectional. So um, how many languages does your um, team speak? If you're based in San Diego, uh, do you have anyone who is familiar with the Latinx community? Because we have such a big Latinx community in uh, San Diego. Um, for different abilities, um, do you have someone that is in tune with uh, uh, you know, people who have intellectual developmental disabilities? Um, there are so many different lenses you have to have on your grant making, you can't have them all. And so thinking about who are your army of support to ensure as you're reviewing these grants and as you are pushing forward with your um, with your different decisions that you have these people who are able to inform those decisions, but ensuring that those decisions are always coming from the top and the people who have authority instead of people who are always feeling like it's a grassroots movement and they're not actually able to have any impact. That's great, Tana. I'm just thinking about how leaning into the strengths that you already have with your team and just lifting up their strengths and supporting them. I think that just makes the team a whole lot stronger. And so I love that. And I'd be curious to know, um, Annie, just also from your perspective, having a larger team and with a larger ERG structure, what's a great place that you have found is helpful to start? I'm sorry, you're, you froze slightly when you said the very last part of that question. For sure, no, for sure. What's, <laughs> what's been a great start for your team? In terms of collaborating with our mm -hmm. DE and I yeah. partners? Well, we are, you know, I, I inherited a, um, a great structure in that our um, employee resource groups have three pillars that are written into all their, their, um, their foundational structures from leadership development, networking, and professional development, um, and community service. 
So I get the community service piece of it. So all the ERGs um, in our local, on a local level and on a national level, work very closely with the corporate citizenship team to help fulfill that community service um, requirement. But I will say the ERGs, they are employee resource group. They are one of my greatest resources, period, in terms of the STEM education outreach that I do. Um, we'll do Spanish um, speaking career nights in STEM and our Adelante ERG um, is the first one I go to, to see, um, to get their help and be the speakers and our engineers that are fluent in Spanish. Um, we had some students come over from Japan two years ago to work on um, some UAV projects. They were high school students in our um, Asian American Pacific Islander ERG um, came to the table and was very, very helpful in terms of making the students feel comfortable um, and also helping us from a cultural perspective. Um, I just saw Sarah's, Sarah's question. Um, as Tiana was talking, we don't pay our ERG leaders because we are a um, government contractor and we're, our budgeting is really kind of funky. We also don't pay our volunteers, which is, is an ongoing discussion, but I'm seeing more and more companies paying their ERG leaders. And given the work and the time that they put in, I think it makes so much sense. Um, so one of the things we as a company try and be very um, wary of is not overtasking our ERG leaders and making them ultimately responsible as volunteers um, for our DEI strategy. They're just one element of a much larger um, machine. Thank you, thank you. And hearing the, and I understand if I remember correctly, your Northrop Grumman uh, team size is about 13 ERGs and Tian, I believe your team is about eight just recently having grown to that size. And what was uh, the size before Tiana? I think for the first year, we only had three. Um, mm -hmm. with kind of bubblings of some of the younger ones. Um, so right now we have, yeah, we have eight and I think two of them were created within 2021. Okay, so you're, you're definitely growing, but I definitely see also perspectives and size and organizations. And so I'd love to hear some, some pros and cons. And if we can start with you, Tiana, and those kind of growing pains that you've experienced with getting the larger, more rather ERGs on your side. Yeah, and I think this is very similar to, I'm sure all of us on the call, um, when you have a smaller team, you're more nimble. Uh, it is easier to get everyone together. It's easier to hear everyone's voices. It's easier to hear input and make people feel valued and at the table. Sometimes when you have a little bit of a larger team or something that's more established, people feel like they are just a cog in the system instead of helping build build something together. Um, and so that's been really exciting as being able to see these ERG leaders and the DNI team and our team able to build what is the actual infrastructure. Um, this year is actually um, the first year that we have implemented um, our business projects and our social impact projects. Um, and our social impact projects, uh, for example, those are projects that um, the ERG leaders are working with me on. And one of them is actually translating our educational material into different languages. Um, so ensuring that we have um, we have equitable access, no matter what language you're speaking, to the genomic curriculum that we're already putting out. So that's been very exciting and, and being able to be a part of something new and knowing that what we're building now um, will have dividends much further in the future. Um, that said, anything that is new, everything is new. Um, and so that's been, a, um, is definitely a little bit of a pain point. And then I think sometimes people enter into this work um, and are unaware of this specific issue. And so um, may not necessarily be educated in certain topics when they speak about it, which is okay. It just requires time for people to uh, become educated and, and joining a community of people that we keep each other accountable into um, what is the language you use to speak around certain issues, as well as also how are we making sure that we're promoting um, healthy boundaries when it comes to burnout of building something new. Um, I think another pain point is um, a lack of clarity from particularly the leadership that is building these ERGs to the actual ERG leaders. Um, many of the ERG leaders, they do not have time to really think deeply and strategically about um, these very amoebous 
tasks that we've given them. And so it's finding that balance between how are you giving them the freedom to be able to form something and direct something with their team, but also ensuring that they always feel supported and they know they have a leadership backing and that they are not on their own because this is not their full-time job and this is not something that should completely overwhelm them and burn them out. Um, I've read many stories about ERG leaders who two years into their tenure are just so burnt out, don't want anything to do with the ERG anymore because they've been tasked so often. So ensuring that, especially when you're creating something new and something is very grassroots, that you're having really honest conversations with these ERG leaders who oftentimes tend to be um, people of color and may have other responsibilities outside of their job, especially in this work from home. Um, I'm sure that some of you have realized, but um, working from home is not equitable. Um, there are different responsibilities people have at home, especially working mothers um, or working fathers or people with different responsibilities. So it's important um, as people who are helping shape these programs that may require more strategic thought that you're carrying holistically for the employees and both their mental and physical well-being. So a lot of pros and cons, uh, you know, that. it's fun because it's, it's something new and it's inspiring and you know that you're building something for future generations, but burnout rates are very, very high because people are putting these, their heart and soul into this. And I'm thrilled you mentioned burnout because one thing I've been hearing from a lot of folks is that, you know, this last year sort of opened a window, so to speak, of having a renewed public attention towards issues of racial equity and how that racial inequity and how that factors into pretty much larger social system, but we're hearing that a lot of folks, they're still interested, they're just getting tired. It's sometimes it's exhausting, it's emotionally exhausting, it's a lot of introspection. And so just building that into the plan, I think is really important, building rest into the plan. There's an organization called the NAP Ministries and it's called NAP for a reason. It's really talking about the importance of just resting as a part of the larger end goal of activating change in our social sector. So I'm really thankful you mentioned that. And Annie, I'm sure with the larger team, there are similar yet different pros and also pain points that I'd love to hear about. Yeah, and as Tiana was speaking, there, there are a lot of similarities um, between both structures and, and starting points. One of the things I will say is when you have a very well-established um, large ERG program, um, there are, it can sometimes take a long time to do things, move things, make decisions. Um, so you lose that sort of nimbleness or ability to pivot very quickly. Um, with that said, the structure I think really helps build sustainability um, in terms of rotating leaders and how decisions are made and um, just keeping a very sort of um, stable structure um, for such a a big company and creating consistency. As a 90,000 person company, we need our ERGs to all sort of follow the same guidelines and rules um, just because it can become crazy very quickly um, when everybody is doing something different. So there are so many benefits to the amazing structure that Northrop Grumman has built, but um, when you have something that big, uh, sometimes it's hard to see when changes need to happen. And I think the civil unrest last, that started last spring was a very eye-opening for everyone at Northrop Grumman, but certainly our de &I team did amazing work in terms of what they needed to, to address very quickly. Um, and it can just be hard to um, move things down the road or, or make changes and address um, burning issues. No, for sure. And um, I appreciate folks also adding to the conversation in the chat box. And one thing that is a recurring question, I'd like to kind of, if I can toss it to you, Tiana, since you mentioned paying the ERGs, but is that support that happens through a stipend? Yeah, I, I believe it happens through a stipend um, as well as, um, I'm not extremely familiar with the actual pro um, process, but I do know on the back end, um, these ERG leaders are fast tracked for promotions. Um, so I believe that there's a normal cycle with HR about um, as soon as someone can get a promotion, but I have seen with my own eyes that ERG leaders tend to be promoted much more quickly, as well as also have more access to senior leadership than they would otherwise. But I, I believe that there is a small stipend um, associated with that. 
Thank you for sharing. And also I'd be curious to know, picking back, picking, backing off of that, are the ERG groups grassroots or have there been any that have come top down? You know, sometimes with corporations, it's tricky. It sometimes seems grassroots, but someone may have planted it. But from at least my knowledge, all of them have been grassroots. Um, all of them have been led by an employee who is passionate about the issue and wants to rally people together. Um, I, but being honest about the burnout, every two years, it feels a little bit different. And I think and Annie, as you were saying this, it's that structure is, is really nice. And I think that there in structure, there are boundaries and there are specific tasks that an ERG lead has to do. Um, and I've seen, I would say half of our ERG leads just really burn out in the first year um, in implementation. Yeah, no, for sure. And that thinking about how we can support those ERG groups, I'd be curious to know, Annie, from your, your team, rather from your team's perspective, what has been like the, the impetus for starting these groups and what has been helpful in supporting and sustaining them? You know, since I've been at Northrop Grumman, I've only seen one new ERG um, come be founded. Um, I think a lot of them started very grassroots. The latest ERG that we launched about a year ago, um, sort of fortuitously, was, a, was an ERG that supported remote workers. So that employees, and this is pre-COVID, so employees that are not at one of our sites or maybe sitting at one of our um, our military bases and are sort of separated from our larger employee population um, had connections and could share um, similar experiences. So um, I think that probably came out of a lot, a great deal of collaboration from um, leadership and HR and um, these employees as well, just speaking up. Um, I think ERGs are definitely led by the passionate employee who steps up. Um, and I've, that's obviously, I think, how most of them were started. Um, but I think at Northrop Grumman, really, honestly, to get things done and get things um, to get a new ERG started now, certainly because um, different topics come up all the time, you need that senior leadership support. For sure, for sure. And you mentioned the collaboration that's important and it sounds like that's a critical element to sustaining the teamwork between both the CSR and the DEI teams. And I know that in 2020, there were a lot of statements and there were a lot of grants towards racial justice. And I'd be curious, are there other strategies or tips to really help the company sustain that momentum between both teams? Well, for us, one of the changes that we made was each person like me who owns a territory um, or a, a communities that Northrop Grumman is in um, was assigned directly to a specific ERG so that we could really um, advise at the top level and help them sort of flow down that collaboration and create a very strong strategy in terms of um, the work that they were interested in and engaging our communities. Um, so that was one of the big steps we took. Um, and I think also just more collaboration and thinking things through. One of the things I think about this year with Engineers Week, um, we have always put on great programming for our employees and for local students. And this year I reached out to our African-American task group and we collaborated on a really cool STEM engagement activity where they did like a bingo with African-American STEM leaders over, um, over like the last hundred years. And it was really cool and really fun. They were really excited about it and we were really excited about it. And like, as I said earlier, ERGs being my greatest resource, uh, bringing them to the table to create that exciting and really cool new activity was like the biggest win because not only were they engaged and students were learning um, about different pieces of STEM history, um, it also really helped me create a better um, overall engineers week. So I think just increased collaboration and also building in some actual structural changes. Excellent, and after, for sure. And, and Tiana, um, I'll put your team, would you say those resonate for you as well? Yeah, and you know, I was actually curious in, in hearing from the group, I know Annie and I have talked about ERGs a lot, but I know that probably not everyone on the call has an ERG. Um, I also want to go back to, I think this DNI work, even if you don't have a DNI leader, the work that you do can have a DNI lens on it. 
um, I think it's really important as people who are giving grants that there is a DNI lens to all the work that we do, and that requires a responsibility to be educated in these issues. Um, I think it's really important to have a support system that is able to inform you on these decisions, but I do think that it is important to also tell grantees that this is an issue you care about. Um, I oftentimes think about um, when we are, or when, you know, as in general, as practitioners are distributing grants, oftentimes grantees, they propose something because I mean, no grant is sexy, but you know, some grants are more sexy, like they're just new and innovative and cool. But I think sometimes with some of these uh, nonprofits, like they just need capacity building and they need um, they need cars, which isn't exactly the sexiest thing to, to fund, but just thinking about being really honest with practitioners. And so thinking about, you don't have to have a DNI team, you don't have to have ERGs, but how are you establishing almost like your Avengers team to make sure the decisions that you are making are informed um, and have a different perspective? So I know this session is all about building out that relationship with your DNI team. And uh, we've talked a lot about ERGs, but I also wanted to give a reminder that as practitioners, um, it's my opinion that it's it's a priority in everything that we do, and it's a responsibility as practitioners to be aware of these issues, as well as also making it a, a clear priority for you, for the grantees that this is a area of focus. Because I think everyone on this call, by simply being on this call, um, understands this is something that's very important to us, and is not just something that we um, are putting out there as a 2030 goal or as a UN sustainability goal. No, for sure. And that's a great point talking about the grants component and also remembering that it's it's everyone's role to really prioritize this, not just one specific team. And I'd love to hear Annie also just your perspectives and to complement what Tiana was saying about the grants um, portion of the work that your team does. About the grant portion of the work mm -hmm. that we do? Okay. And the plan, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't agree more with all the that Tiana shared uh, that you don't necessarily need a DEI official group to be doing this work. Um, separate of our DEI groups, um, we as the corporate citizenship team and our grant making um, have always sort of leaned towards um, having that additional focus area of DEI. It only became official this year as part of our sort of structural changes, but um, you know, addressing the issue of underrepresented minorities in the STEM talent pipeline is critical to the work that Northrop Grumman does in building, um, continuing as a company and having innovation and being at the and cutting edge of technology. So um, in the work that we do and our education outreach, I think we all know that if we are not reaching out to every community possible um, and supporting educational opportunity, um, then we're not actually doing our jobs very well. Um, one of the things, the, one of the statements that everyone's probably familiar with that I always say, and we always say is that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. So aside from even um, an ERG program or official, you know, talent acquisition, reviewing blind resumes um, and addressing unconscious bias training in the work that we do as grant makers, it's our job to look at um, those gaps um, and where there's opportunity and where there are communities that need our support um, and that can feed into our overall CSR strategy of building this strong talent, um, diverse talent pipeline. I think that prioritization of gaps is important, leans into something that Tiana had mentioned earlier. And so that'll be an opportunity for us to chat in groups. We're gonna break into groups momentarily for folks to, to this, and we'll have a prompt in there for strategies that your teams can begin to explore. But before we do, I'd love to hear, um, Annie, if we can hear from you, just a hopeful vision, you talked about it a little bit, but a hopeful vision of, of the future of collaboration between DFD and I, CSR, or just rather the CSR teams and their extended prioritization and focus on DNI. Annie, can we start with you? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm having technological issues. I have to apologize. Um, my, I, I would like to see actual impact and change in moving the needles in underrepresented um, uh, groups in STEM. I wanna see more women. I, I wanna see um, more people who are non-neurotypical. I wanna see um, more African-Americans and Latinx and um, groups in engineering and 
and techno technology driven areas. Um, I think the work that we're doing to build that pipeline to I and just the K-12 piece of it um, is really, really fundamental right now. And to see that pulled all the, the way through to or the Grumman or any company, I would just like to see those those numbers change. And I think that not only is our leadership very committed to it, but our employee employee population is. Um, so as hard as the last year has been and as difficult as the civil unrest last spring was, I think it really woke a lot of woke things up in a lot of our employees to be even more committed to this work. So that is my hopeful vision. Wonderful. Tiana, I'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about the future um, and thinking about last year. I think last year brought a lot of issues to light that were not new. Um, these were issues that many people have been championing for years, but I think it had an increased awareness in the general community about issues in the workplace. Um, I mean, I'm sure we all know, but being an anti-racist organization, it's not a it's not a static achievement. It's really an everyday commitment that you have to make every single day. Um, and so my hope for the future is now that some people are informed about some issues they may have been unaware of, they continue this lifelong journey and this recommitment every single day. There's a lot of fears, I think, that this is going to be a phase and that people will no longer be passionate about or no longer interested in. It. Um, I don't necessarily believe that that is, that is true because I do, I do believe the arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. Um, and so I think my hope for the future is that we, we as practitioners and as people who with a lot of power in this space um, are able to remain champions of these diversity, equity and inclusion and belonging issues and ensuring that we are everyday reminders to our colleagues that this is something that's important and should be a filter and a lens on everything that we do. Um, I think as a grantor that is in conversations with grantees, there can oftentimes be a power dynamic, but ensuring that at least with the, with the sphere of influence that we have, it is something that we maintain as an important issue every single day. Um, that said too, um, I actually recently had a conversation with um, one of my career mentors and she said, uh, make sure that your job doesn't fill up emotional cups that it shouldn't. And so I also give a word of caution for people in this space. Um, this is a shared responsibility. We have so many different organizations on this call right now, and we all have a shared interest in furthering d and um, not just in the workplace, but in the world. So ensuring that um, when we're doing this work, uh, of course, it is a very deeply personal mission, but also knowing at the same time that we are we live in a community of care that is looking after not just each other, but for the world as we're moving forward. So I think that that is my hope in moving forward is that we become more transparent with how important these issues are, but also transparent with each other as practitioners as we're realizing that as organizations, we are separate, but we all have the same goal. And so I think that's a wonderful thing about being in this space is, you know, Annie and I may be competing for engineers, but we're not competing for increasing diversity in STEM. So thinking about how are we joining together on these really big swings, these moonshot goals, and ensuring that nonprofits know that we're really all in this together um, and ensuring um, not just in the STEM space, but in any space that we are increasing equity and, and uh, opportunities for, for people. Thank you. And I have to second uh, Sarah has mentioned Tiana because that was great and both also to you Annie but what I appreciated what you just mentioned right now Tiana is um, the focus on accountability for funders and the need to build trust with grantees I think that's a great way to address the power imbalances that you mentioned earlier and so I appreciate you bringing that forward and so I'm looking forward to my mind is buzzing we're going to break into groups really briefly groups of about three to four and we'll just be chatting for about 10 minutes to brainstorm what are um, some strategies that you can begin to explore um, connecting your DEI and CSR teams. It could be from things that you heard today or also something that maybe you were working on with your team that you'd like to workshop with some peers.